Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of Method Ministries. I'm your host, Lucas Curcio, and I did it. I found a reformed Armenian to have a conversation with. <laughs> so I'm really looking forward to it. Dalton, welcome to the show. Oh, thank you. Thank you for having me on. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you're you're a rare bird, and I say that because, like, I you know, I found a reformed Arminian. I found classical Arminians like Dan Chapa, and Dan Chapa is a great guy, knowledgeable. But you're a actual reformed, you know, true blood, pure blood, reformed Arminian. <laughs> so, you know, really excited to have you. If you want to go ahead and introduce yourself to the audience, sure. My name's Dalton. I run uh, the Reformed Arminian, which is um, well, it's a couple of different things. I have the YouTube channel. Um, I had several episodes. Uh, life got a little hectic, though, so I had to kind of pause it. But I am going to be bringing that back and trying to do regular ones now. Um, I'm trying to start off this uh, this with uh, my commentary on Romans 9. Mm. Once uh, Dr. Bashiano <laughs> greenlights my script, I'm going to wow. start recording, editing, and publishing this massive, uh, this massive commentary on Romans 9. Um, so that's going to be my first video, Lord willing, um, after that. But most people know me because of my Facebook uh, page, The Reformed Arminian, which I started as a kind of way to advertise the YouTube channels. Then I realized uh, things got a little too hectic. So I use it mainly for memes and stuff. That's where most people know me from. Mm -hmm. So... Yeah, and uh, as I was telling you, you know, before the show, your memes are hilarious. A lot of times, like I'm always always laughing, <laughs> cracking up. I share them a couple of times on my Facebook page, but you have a you know, you know decent amount of followers on there too. So you know, but you know, appreciate your work. And, uh, and oh, no. <laughs> I I I was in non-Calvinist and other Armenian like groups that was yeah. supposed to be for memes, and I realized these are like really not good. Um, I'm not going to name names. <laughs> um, but they were like really out of date. They're like 2012, 2013 style memes. And you know, memes are like, they have to be updated, continue you have to be updated yeah, yeah, yeah. on this stuff. And it was just a wall of text. It looked like a leftist meme. Um, some of them I was like, Oh Lord, this is this all my side has to offer. Like, okay. <laughs> I always say, you know, I'm going to repeat what that, uh, they told me at high school graduation, be the change you want to see in the world. So, <laughs> yeah. but you can, but you can use memes to, communicate truth and i like using them to point yeah. out to people the absurdities of certain views and sometimes a meme is really good for communicating that it's like oh yeah that yeah. is actually something that's weird and funny but it's funny because it's true and hopefully people just wake up a little bit i know i've seen a lot of people who get really um onto the calvinist meme pages and hmm. let me be honest they are they're pretty decent um and i've seen people who get attached to that and had not experienced Calvinism before and they think it's funny and they kind of are end up drawn into Calvinism because of memes because you know it's actually not too bad a way to like advertise your theology out there um, yeah exactly yeah yeah like I said like there is some truth behind it you know you know jokes are usually funny because they're true it's usually getting <laughs> some part about reality and just showing the absurdity of it like dad jokes are a perfect way to do that it's like you take something literal make it literal and then it's funny <laughs> And stuff like that. You know, we're getting into to the theology of memes. <laughs> yeah. So that's, uh, I was like, my side needs better advertising. So I was like, I'm just going to try it myself. So. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I did title this Reformed Armenians versus Wesleyanism. <laughs> uh, so we're not really, you know, debating like that. But I do want to give the viewers a chance to be like, well, what's the difference between those two? Is there a difference? <clears throat> and there is not, you know, not, not huge. But I want to talk to you because you're really uh, knowledgeable of, of this whole uh set or in a sect or theology of yeah. James Arminius. And so do you want to go ahead and tell our audience, one, can you be a reformed Arminian and what is a, for a reformed Arminian? Okay, sure. Absolutely. So a um, little backstory. Despite me being a reformed Arminian is actually, I have to thank the Wesleyans for actually winning me over. Um, uh. It was a, it was a combination of reading the early church fathers, Justin and uh, Justin Martyr and Tertullian and a okay. few others, uh, the book of Hebrews with the warning passages and Jerry Walls, who is mm. a Wesleyan. Yeah. So um, <laughs> y'all are to blame for this monstrosity. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so Armenianism, I kind of break it down in like I do in my videos is in order to be Armenian, first off, you have to, you have to fall. I, I do it uh, on umbrellas. So one, mere Christendom, which I usually uh, say is like the Apostles' Creed and Nicene Creed, 
um, unless you're Southern Baptist, I guess. Like Wilson, um, ah. <laughs> you like yeah, Doug Wilson so, in your Christendom? <laughs> yep. <laughs> <laughs> Man, you're Christian nationalist. Okay, let's get into it. Oh, no, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> so we got uh mere christendom mere christianity as the apostles creed and nicene creed so in order to be arminian you, you have to fall under that and then you got mere protestantism the five solas so that means the five solas and kind of augustinianism semi-augustinianism yeah. and then you have mere arminianism which i claim is the five articles of remonstrance and then under that you have the two possibly three i don't know how to handle the churches of christ they're not unified on theirs and some of them are not augustinian anyways so you got the wesleyan view and then you have the well i'd say the reformed arminian view so it is i mean probably is the best way i'd put it is the arminianism of jacob arminius himself when it comes to soteriology okay i like that so that's that's the kind of way i try to define it so instead of just going near armenian because a lot of Calvinists use that as a catch-all term for anything that's not them. Um, I heard I've heard Calvinists call Unitarians and anti-Trinitarian Armenian. Like, well, hold on. And then for the life of me, oh, good Lord. I heard them calling Roman Catholics Armenians. Um, oh, like, you know what? I've heard that too, and that's yeah, that doesn't work. Uh, that's a historical. Yes, it's. I mean, gosh. The guy, I mean, in Arminius, his uh, parents, his mother and his siblings were murdered by Spanish Roman Catholics. He took the name Arminius like a few months after that, which is the German heroic figure who gave the Romans their biggest defeat, which I don't think is um, just coincidence that he chose that name not long after his family had been slaughtered. I think he did actually have quite a vengeance in his earlier years um, against the Roman Catholic Church. So I think uh, yeah, it's just it's just ludicrous. Anyways, so I... Um, I try and specify a reformed Armenian uh, for usually one of two reasons, which is to distinguish myself as a, um, instead of just Armenians being whatever is not Calvinist to very specific that also it gets you clicks. Um, yeah. <laughs> I was like, Wait a second. <laughs> so it starts looking for reformed theology, reformed memes, uh, reformed Baptist. You come Baylor. up. Yeah, it, yeah. I come up. There we go. I but got yeah, They see reform. Like, wait a minute. Armenian. What? Is that a misspelling? <laughs> I've had so many people I'm like, you mean like Armenian? Like you're a Calvinist Arme oh, yeah, Armenian? Yeah, yeah. I'm like, no. <laughs> no. Um, <laughs> well, you know what? Uh, let me say this because usually let's talk about the reform side. What does it mean? Sure. Because people usually don't know this. And again, you know, they hear that word tur uh, that term reformed Armenian. Mm -hmm. like, that's a misnomer, but they don't know the history right. behind this. So like what, you know, what does it mean that to say that Jacob himself, and, and he claimed to be reformed, how did he right. reconcile that with his views? <clears throat> so we're, uh, Arminius says reformed himself? Yeah. Um, so there's a couple of different ones. Actually, I have an entire video that uh, breaks this down. I Actually, I still have my notes from that. Let me see awesome. if I can pull this up real quick. Um, so a lot of people kind of treat it as, well, Arminianism is, uh, is a branch off of reformed. Um, I don't think that's true, actually. I think Calvinism and Reformed do not mean the same thing. Just ask any Presbyterian or Dutch Reformed what they think of Reformed. Oh, Baptist. yeah, I totally agree. Yeah. <laughs> Just ask them what they think of that, um, of the Reformed Baptist. You're going to say, no, they're not Reformed. Yeah. They're Calvinists, they're not Reformed. So they're, they can't, I, even among Calvinists themselves, they're not uniform. Um, so if you ask like a Dutch Reformed like I have, they don't consider Presbyterians um, to be Reformed. Some of them don't. Okay. You have to hold to one of the traditional, the original confessions. And the Westminster oh, wow. didn't come around until 1646. Um, hmm. So there's not a lot of agreement even within the Calvinist camp sometimes. Um, but Reformed, the Reformed Church was very, um, which much more broad than we might have realized. So Carl Banks, um, his book on the biography of Arminius, talks about the early years of the Dutch Reformed. And one of them is the fact that... Um, there's not a uniform um, view of soteriology. And he, so he lists off many very famous ministers who don't hold to Calvinism within the Dutch Reformed Church. In the Netherlands, you have a lot of diversity. You have the Lutherans, the Anabaptists, the Roman Catholics, and then you have the Reformed. And even among themselves, they are not entirely in agreement. So the Heidelberg is an example. So um, without breaking it too far into detail, the Heidelberg was meant to be a document that unified the Reformed, uh, the Protestants in uh, and the land under Frederick the Third of the Palatinate. Okay. So you had not the Calvinists, but the followers of Bullinger, 
who is sometimes called a Calvinist, and Melanchthon. And this was meant to be a unifying um, document that it was vague enough on these issues that they could be worked together on this, which is why the canons of Dort, like uh, Joel Beakey and other scholars will note that begrudgingly, that the Heidelberg and the Belgic were not, uh, re had to be reinforced, he says, um, because technically Arminius does not break the Catechism or the Confession. He does not violate them. Um, they are intentionally vague on purpose because it was meant to be a unifying document. Yeah, he argued not that too, that he was in line with it. Yes. So he was in line with this. Um, Matthew Pinson actually has a chapter on this in his book, 40 Questions About Arminianism, mm -hmm. uh, which is uh, breaks this whole, whole thing down. Um, so that would be a really good uh, one to go to. So I don't know how far you want to go into the year, though, because I have. Well, uh, yeah, you know what? I do have a question for you because, you know, you mentioned sure. how there's a distinction between even with Calvinism and Reformed theology. Yeah. Do you hold, uh, are, are you yourself, uh, do you hold to credo baptism or pedo baptism? So I hold to uh, credo baptism. Okay. Um, not the traditional one that's kind of held by my church now. I, I prefer to try and go back to the history of the Baptist of the 1600s, um, where gotcha. like you don't have Zwinglianism, for example. They hold to the Reformed view of the sacraments. And something actually does uh, supernaturally happen at baptism would be a it's efficacious, I think, is the term they used, um, instead of just merely a symbol. So that that's okay. usually one that's brought up is like, okay, gotcha. well, okay, you, you... yeah, because I because because you can find classical Arminians. I can't find a reformed Arminian. Well, one they're hard to find, but if you find them, I don't think I've ever ever found a reformed Arminian who's a Pado Baptist. Like right. there were four lines. I love him. He's a classical Arminian. Uh, Matthew Pinson goes by Reformed yeah. Dominion. He's a Baptist because he comes from that the seminary. Uh, what uh, was it? Wel Welch College. Welsh, yeah, Welsh yeah. College. And so they're they're credo Baptist. So that would just be yes. one, I guess, difference between like the Methodists <laughs> and the Reformed Arminians is that the Reformed Arminians exist today. They yeah. seem to be just the the, the Baptists. But I'm not going to say the you know traditionalist in that sense because you know yeah. classical Arminianism is much better than just the standard. Baptist theology or soteriology <clears throat> and everything. So I don't want to knock them there. Yeah, it's uh, probably the one that would be Reformed Arminian that would not be technically Wesleyan because, of course, the Wesleyans, um, with the exception of the Wesleyan Church, strangely enough, uh, they all baptize infants. So like the Nazarenes and all these other ones do relatively follow to that practice, but they're all Wesleyan, not Reformed Arminian. So usually you find them in the Anglican Church. Um, but you kind of have to, the problem there is they usually fall into uh, Anglo Catholics or some other high church where they don't really follow with Arminius. Like some of them will say seven sacraments and all these other things, which is kind of outside the purview. So they kind of yeah, get I, up you, in yeah, very interesting. And uh, another thought that I had too is that looking at the Methodist Church, Wesleyan Church, I. I, I was thinking, you know, a little bit a while back, it's like you can almost say this is the Arminian church. Mm. I find it strange how the reformed Arminianism, the classical Arminianism, didn't solidify into a denomination. Mm -hmm. really, like I know, well, actually, we, you know, that's not true. There is, there is to this day a reformed uh, Arminian church. What is it? What country is it? Wales? Or you, you're, you're, you mean the remonstrance? The remonstrance. Oh, Lord, not that but that, they are like the be epitome first. of what it means to be progressive. <laughs> so you don't want to go in, you know, anywhere near that, which is a shame. But but that you know they do have the history behind it. But even in America, though, like it never solidified into a denomination, mm -hmm. and, and it would have been cool to see that happen. And I think you know that would have been beneficial in terms of the. It seems to be the option of you got Methodism, Anglicanism. And then you got this evangelical non-denominational, then the Reformed Baptist experience. It would have been cool to have mm -hmm. Reformed Arminian denomination <clears throat> into the full mix, which is weird that it never happened. It's it's sadly unfor it's unfortunate. The um the way it kind of broke down is because of the persecution that happened around the time of the Synod of Dort. Um, so it was seen as an opportunity to kind of get uh, to clear house. Um, the Arminians and the Calvinist or counter remonstrance. Um, had a lot of disagreements. Uh, part of it is their politics. A lot of it was politics. A lot of people just think it's soteriology and like, oh no, it's so much deeper than that. The re, uh, counter remonstrants, the Calvinists, were 
the favored among the poorest class and among the aristocracy. So we have the um, the Prince of Orange. The Arminians were most popular around the middle class, the, the merchant class. They were very much Republicans, a Calvinist uh, with the Prince of Orange, a little less so. Um, the Arminians tended to favor uh, pe eventual peace with Spain because, okay, we've secured our boundaries. Now let's push for peace. And part of it is the trade. It disrupts life and makes things difficult economically for people. And so they're pushing for this peace. Calvinists want to take it over Flanders, modern day Belgium. And they are going to use this opportunity of the Senate of Dort to go after them as traitors. Mm -hmm. um, so they start purging them. You have uh, the execution of basically the prime minister, Olden, Bold Ol uh, Olden Barnevelt, who favored the Arminians. Um, you had Hugo Grotius, who was, uh, he was not a theologian, he was a lawyer and statesman. Uh, he was captured. Eventually, he his wife snuck him out. She had like this box of books because he was uh, really? uh, restrained. And he, yeah. he climbed in and she oh. carried him out. <laughs> thinking I was like carrying his books. Uh, he went to England. So that's where Arminianism helps get broadcast to England. And it's mostly through the Anglicans that you start to see Arminianism start to to go out. You have Jeremy Taylor, Henry Hammond, and um, some other ones I'm drawing a blank on at the moment. Um, okay, I didn't know that. Yes, which is where Wesley gets actually some of his his Arminianism from is from Hugo Grotius, who was translated in English, and then some of the Arminians that um, came through that, which was uh, uh, John Goodwin, who was a Puritan. Oh, okay, that I heard of. Yes, yes, yeah, he's a so. Fan. That's actually where the Wesleyans get it from. Uh, well, Wesley gets it from oh. is uh, is through uh, Grotius influence on the Anglicans. So okay, yeah, because. You, you know, just uh, just for the viewers. So Wesleyans are still Arminians. They just put mm -hmm. Wesley Arminian in front of it. And yes. It's like a different flavor of it. But even John Wesley, he had a magazine called the Arminian Magazine. Mm -hmm. And then yes. he published it. And then he loved Jacob Arminius himself too. And uh, mm -hmm. quoted him, you know, here and there. But let, you know, uh, let's talk about some differences. Sure. Uh, so the first question is, what makes you a reformed Arminian and not a Wesleyan? Okay, so there's a couple of different things. Some of them you kind of have to get a microscope to find. Yeah. Um, so I'd say like the the first things was even though I was exposed to Wesleyanism relatively like early on, I as a historian came across the Wesleyans as a group, a political group, and um, hmm. and my knowledge of the Wesleyans at the time when I was growing up was uh, women's ordination, baptism of infants. Uh, theological liberalism and um, kind of being limp wristed on the gay stuff when I was a, when I was growing oh, up. So okay, I, gotcha. I didn't grow yeah. up with the most positive image yeah. of uh, the best that the Wesleyan tradition has to offer. Um, and then I got exposed to them through history. Um, but I have I, I can go through that later on, but I don't want to detract from that too much. Um, so some of the things that they um, they kind of differ on are really kind of minute you have to find a you have to get a microscope to find some of the differences there's if you don't look at it closely you don't see it maybe one of them is justification there's a that's more of a minute yeah one. you know what this is great because um i do want to talk about this actually yeah yeah, so let's talk, yeah. But it's, yeah, so, continue. yeah so there's uh justification there's in sanctification um to a minor extent, there's the atonement issue. That's only w later Wesleyans, actually, yeah. um, which we can get into. I I, I uh, look a lot into the differences on the Wesleyans, uh, the earlier ones versus the later ones. And then um, the last one, let me go through my notes real quick. Uh, Prevenient Grace. That one, that one's kind of the hardest one, in my opinion. Um, but All these we have I want to talk about actually is perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Because so those, oh, I'm sorry, go, go on. Oh, okay, yeah. So I'm gonna say, well, you know, what? Uh, let's start with justification because a lot of people don't know this. We we have different nuances. Now, I you know, I just want to clarify. We both believe in justification by faith alone. Mm -hmm. so neither one of us are saying you're justified by works. Wesleyans didn't teach that. Jacob Arminius didn't teach that. So we're not saying that. Mm -hmm. But like you know, there's right. different understandings uh, or nuances as as as, as, uh, as the word I want to use. Mm -hmm. Not. Not that we're being nuanced, but I'm saying the doctrine can have nuance. Yeah. Um, so, so let's talk about that. So what? Yeah. So what would you say is the difference between the Wesleyan view of justification and the Reformed Arminian view? 
So the biggest one, and unlike with the atonement issue, um, where you have the early Wesleyans versus the early later Wesleyans, this one I think has been pretty consistent. There are exceptions like Thomas Oden um, on this issue, but Reformed Armenians from Arminius to the General Baptist, Thomas Granton, Thomas Monk, um, and those ones, the biggest issue is on justification, the imputation of the active obedience of Christ. So Wesleyans believe in the passive obedience. So the passive obedience is Christ dying on the cross. The active obedience is the keeping of the law, which is imputed to believers. So that's the biggest issue on justification. Yeah, uh, I just read re recently a sermon by John Wesley. I believe it was called The Lord of Righteousness. I th think that was the one. And, yes. and, you know, he goes into this. But uh, Wesley actually didn't want to make a distinction between those two, passive and active. Mm -hmm. And But uh, you are right to say that, though, because I myself have used those terms, too, too. And I think they're helpful, even though Wesley kind of didn't want to make a distinction of it. I, I do agree, mm -hmm. as a Wesleyan, too, and this is where we could talk about our, our differences, is that um, I don't believe, just like Wesley, that Christ is a substitute for our, our actual obedience. I believe he's mm -hmm. a substitute for our penal sufferings. Mm -hmm. So our, uh, Wesley, just understand the, the historical context, he was very anti-nomianism. Anti, uh, so anti-nomianism means mm -hmm. uh, like easy believers. Like, law. Yeah, like you can live like yeah. hell, be an atheist. <laughs> all the way to day your death and you're still a believer or you're still saved because you believe once even if you no longer believe today so right. wesley was always against it and he was always putting safeguards in his theology to prevent this from taking fruit and he believed that the reformed understanding would lead to this and so he wanted to uh, to make careful distinctions between the two but um yeah i do believe that the scriptures teach justification is pardon and wesleyans are careful to articulate that that justification means mm -hmm. The non imputation of sins. It, it's acquittal, it's pardon. And so, in the Reformed view, there seems to be like this. John Wesley w was also uh, adamant to say that God isn't deceived. I'm paraphrasing, but God doesn't look at us as if we're, we're actually obedient, righteous people. He knows we weren't, but he forgives us based upon the atonement of Christ. And in Christ, we are accepted and forgiven. Mm -hmm. Where the Reformers, if you want to explain the Reformed side in contrast to that. Yeah. So, um, Let's see where to start. So, um, so let me actually see if I can find because I yeah this up from Four Lines's arguments. So he focuses a lot on Romans. So he says that Paul stated that it would uh, take us to stand justified before God, absolute righteousness, uh, which we don't have, nor can we produce it. So he refers to Romans three ten and twenty. Uh, so we stand condemned. So a lot of the first three chapters of Romans uh, kind of set forward our need, which is absolute righteousness. Um, and that we're supposed to be doers of the law, not just hearers, but uh, anyone who breaks the law th that sins is basically disqualified as a, as, a, um, as a doer of the law. So he picks it up with, I think, through Romans 3.21, mm. where it, it says, but now. Um, <laughs> The righteousness Bible, of God yeah. manifested apart from the law, and that righteousness is not according to our ability to to keep it, because Christ has kept it perfectly. Um, so the way he puts it, I think if I'm trying to remember correctly, um, that let's see, this uh, referring to Matthew three fifteen, but Jesus answered, said to them, allow uh, allow it as time for it is. Uh, fitting to fulfill all righteousness. Um, so all righteousness is what, what Jews would have understood at the time as also keeping of the whole law. So due to a sacrifice, we would be deemed innocent, but not righteous. Um, he would have to live righteously for us to become, to be labeled as righteous. So his righteousness, his perfect obedience becomes ours and our sin be is transferred to his account. Got so go, I'm sorry, go on. No, no, sorry, that, that's, that's, uh, I can say more on that, but uh, that's kind of like the gist of what Four Lines um, puts forward on this. Okay, yeah, because the thing uh, that I, I noticed too, looking into justification, you know, and especially uh, learning the differences between the two, was that like mm -hmm. Romans 3, um, as you quoted, 
Yeah. Paul would define justification in terms of like like when you when he mentioned justification, he's quick to mention the the acquittal, the pardon, the forgive the forgiveness of our sins. Like he does in Romans three twenty five, when mm-hmm. God sent forth as a propitiation by His blood through faith, to demonstrate His righteousness because in His forbearance God has passed over the sins that were previously committed. Mm-hmm. And then he goes to verse twenty six to demonstrate at the present time His righteousness that He might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. And then you go into Romans four, he talks about, you know, you know, the blessed man, like who is a blessed man? Like if you were yeah. arguing with a Roman Catholic, you would ask them that. Well, the blessed man is the, whom the Lord does not impute uh, iniquities to. And mm-hmm. so in Wesleyanism, there, there is this small distinction between that where we don't want to say that Christ is a substitute for actual obedience because mm-hmm. it's viewed as a real, like, th- like there's a real act of mercy by God in, in pardoning us. It's mm-hmm. because of Christ, it's by Christ, it's through substitutionary atonement, death for us. And at the same time too, though, it's not this transition or transactional form where it's like God's almost thinking that you are a, mil- a billionaire when you're when you're really not. Mm-hmm. In Wesleyanism, God knows you're not a billionaire and you don't and you and you owe him debt that you can't pay, yet he pardons you and and mm-hmm acquits you and that's because of christ substitutionary death so christ death maybe we can get into that a little bit the, the atonement because this you know this connects to that but i don't want to jump yeah. myself i mean we can do that if you want that's actually the very next point after that i made okay uh, um, was there anything, um what was that verse you mentioned by leeward four lines for christ's act of obedience imputed to us um uh, yeah that? yeah imputed to us uh let's see so his righteousness his perfect obedience becomes ours and our sin is transferred to his account. There's like a kind of a, an exchange or however you'd like to put it. But uh, one of the things that he puts it as is um, if all you needed was the sacrifice, then he simply could have become incarnate a week before Passover. Gotcha. Uh, but he born, he was born and lived under the law. So. Okay. Interesting. Interesting. Okay. I'll let you go, uh, continue on the conversation with the atonement. Sure. So the atonement is actually it's not actually the defining feature of the difference between Reformed Arminians and Wesleyan Arminians. It's it's more like Reformed Arminians and the early Wesleyans versus like post World War II, uh, not World War II, post Civil War um, Wesleyans. Yeah. So this would be the penal substitutionary atonement versus the governmental theory of the atonement, um, and this kind of starts off with Hugo Grotius, who is uh, kind of followed after Arminius, though. Um, apparently disagreed with him on the atonement. Uh, so he puts forward what's called the governmental theory. So he held that God could have simply forgiven sins without a sacrifice. Um, but he decided to display how seriously he takes sin in order to kind of uphold his moral government. Uh, so Christ didn't suffer the actual penalty for sins. He suffered a substitute for penalty of sins. It was a provisionary substitute for penalty and not the actual punishment of sin is, um, John Miley puts it. Mm-hmm. Um, so its purpose was to render divine forgiveness consistent with the moral government by showing his horror at sin. So that's kind of the governmental theory in like a, a nutshell. It, uh, so this is very interesting. So um, I don't hold to, to the governmental theory. Mm-hmm. Either. Um, I looked into it, but you are right to make a distinction between the later Wesleyans. Yep. I myself have made recently this year a distinction between John Wesley's Methodism and American Methodism. And that's, I think that's a real important distinction to have in understanding mes- you know, the Wesleyan or the Methodism of John Wesley. Because mm-hmm. John Wesley was an Anglican and he argued that he was in line with it. And so he was mm-hmm. very more sacramental on the side. And you can see this yes. even with the, in his, inf- in his view of baptismal regeneration for, for infants. And then the, when mm-hmm. the American Methodists came on, there was more so a turning from that sacramentology to the more Presbyterian form where it's like, we, you know, you can see as an infant baptism, we baptize, but they're not regenerate. Mm. And, you know, there were some other small distinctions between the two, but then later on the Wesleyans started to go into this more governmental theory of the atonement. And people Mm -hmm. think that that is the Wesleyan view of it. And it's actually not because Wesley did hold to a penal substitutionary atonement. And that was very real. Like, and that was almost at the forefront because, there were other motifs, like, you know, me, uh, me, myself, like I have other motifs, um, in, in what I believe is, is the biblical doctrine of the atonement, but, you know, it doesn't mean that I, I reject the penal satisfaction mm-hmm. 
view, or at least, you know, the majority teaching <clears throat> that, because I think that Christ is a real substitute and for our penal sufferings. Like Christ did satisfy or for propitiate, to use a biblical language, <laughs> he propitiated, you know, the wrath of God. Um, but you know what? I will say though, and this is interesting, and and, and I want to hear hear your thoughts on this too, Dole. Sure. So I'm looking at you know Romans three again, and this is the thing though. I, so I did look into the governmental theory of the atonement, and I think they make some mm -hmm. good points, but I don't hold to that one motif, and I think this is where where usually people get, <clears throat> get stuck. They they tend to take one motif, cut out all the rest, and that's where you can see the errors. Where it's like, no, you can affirm multiple motifs, and I think yeah. there's a governmental motif. I think in the scriptures and that's in romans 3 where paul talks about how christ is the the propitiation to, and he demonstrated his righteousness and so the governmental theory was big on public justice like christ satisfied the mm -hmm. public justice of god yeah so you know just to break that down for the viewers so what that means is that when man sinned against god since God is uh, just, he must uphold his government. Otherwise, he's letting people off the hook and people can say, well, you're not upholding justice. So then how can God forgive now guilty sinners and still be just? Well, you can do that because Christ died for a sub uh, our, us as a substitute. And therefore, as Paul says he, in verse 26 of Romans 3, to demonstrate the present time is righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. And so... Paul, Paul is saying there is that God is justified to justify, and it's because of what Christ did, and he did publicly displayed this. So I do believe that Christ did satisfy the public justice of God. I don't believe that was the only thing he did, but I believe he still did uphold the moral government of God, and Paul is teaching that. Again, it's fun to say it. God is justified to justify. <laughs> so, uh, what do you think about that? I spoke a lot. Uh, it is uh, very Wesleyan of you. Um <laughs> Um, yes, this is something that um, O. Orton Wiley points out that um, noted that the governmental theory, though I don't hold to it, I, I'm penal substitutionary to make guy, uh, does believe that Christ died as a substitute. They're, penal substitutionary is not the only ones who believe in a substitute, you know. Yeah, yeah, also. yeah. Um, but it's, it's uh, I'll say it's very Wesleyan of you because you will find this with the early Wesleyans. So uh, Richard Watson um, in his theological institutes. Uh, who is the first uh, Wesleyan systematic theologian. Uh, he rejects Grotius' view of the atonement, but he did find some of it actually useful. He uses him against the Socinians specifically, who was the bane of Grotius' existence, because um, <laughs> he wrote so much about them and mm. critiquing them as he should have. Um, he, did, he did get a little tongue-tied and actually hurt the cause a little bit with one of his writings, but for the most part, he's like, he was like trying to be, he was trying to be the hammer of the Socinians to, you know, he did okay. Um, but you'll find this with Richard Watson. He uses him as a, um, he thinks some of his critiques, some of his theories are actually useful in dealing with heretics. Uh, then you have William Burt Pope, who again, similarly rejects the governmental theory, but he incorporates certain elements of it into his own. So he is again, like Richard Watson believes in PSA. So he believes that uh, God's moral government was vindicated by the atonement, but this was the result of the atonement rather than the sole purpose of, or the effect of it. So its main purpose was propitiation through a substitute punishment. So Pope does believe in PSA, but he incorporates uh, aspects of the moral government theory, theory and the governmental theory. Yeah, gotcha. Because um, there is also too, you know, you know, as you mentioned, they they do believe the governmental theory in that Christ is, is a substitute, and they even mm -hmm. use like I have Orton Riley's. I don't know if you see it, but it's actually right over here. <laughs> great great systematic, by the way. I, I wholly wholeheartedly recommend that somebody get that. But he but he argues very. It's almost like you you would think he does hold to a PSA the the, the penal substitutionary atonement view because he uses strong mm -hmm. language pretty often when he talks yeah. about the atonement, like Christ is the expiation. The propitiation for for God's justice, and you would think that language wouldn't be there in the governmental theory of the atonement, but actually, you know, as you mentioned, that that's still there. That like Christ still is even in that governmental theory, the propitiation for God's justice. They just say it's public justice. Yeah. There's still an expiation for for that. So, the, so again, Christ is still the, a real real substitute. 
But uh, by the way, did you ever read a book by Obi Tyler Todd on the moral governmental theory of the atonement? I don't think so. So yeah. there's barely any new contemporary literature on this because I wanted to really study this last year. And he wrote it as a as a piece of history, not to vouch for it, because I, I think uh, he's actually a reformer. Oh, huh, um, okay. He, but he talked about, which I did not know too, this is kind of just a side note, that the people who followed the John jonathan edwards theology they actually held and it was popular among them to hold to the moral governmental theory which huh. i did not know and he said like this tied into to, to the politics of the day because they were very pro-american i guess and yeah. so that was like an american thing to say like christ upholds the government of god and somehow they tied this into that aspect which i was i you know this is all news to me like i never heard this or knew about this it's it 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 wouldn't find me entirely surprising. Um, Edwards, despite his popularity with the young, restless, and reformed, uh, he kind of bucked the trend among traditional Calvinists with some mm -hmm. of his theological views, um, including his view of original sin, um, which was not was much more novel. It was not in keeping in line with um, the traditional Calvinist view. He had this kind of um, uh, creation ex nihilo in momento. I don't know the Latin term for it. Uh, because it doesn't exist, I kind of have to coin it myself. He had this idea okay. of um, creation. A kind of like, if you're familiar with atomism, the ancient Greek philosophy, the whole uh, there's no such thing as the someone no, you're entering, than me. <laughs> the entering and exiting. No one enters and exit the same river. Okay, because their molecular right, structure they've changed. They're not the same person. We just think they are. Um, he had this kind of view of original sin in regards to that, that every moment of creation, um, every moment is created a new ex nihilo and they're counted as the same person in the mind of God hmm. is, uh, which was kind of novel for Calvinists. Uh, there's not the traditional view. So he had a couple of very interesting views. I'll put it that way. So it doesn't yeah. entirely surprise me. Um, that's something what? that Thomas McCall talks about in his book. Against ah, God okay. and what, so would you say, uh, you know, to clarify, um, James, Ar James Arminius did hold to the P to the penal substitutionary view of the atonement. Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, I read a multiple <laughs> times, but my memory is a little bit uh, foggy on this because I've been reading some other stuff, and in particular, theology mm. over the last couple of years. So <laughs> I need a refresher sometimes. <laughs> yes, uh, is very traditional reformed when it comes to penal substitutionary atonement. So okay. Before we move on to the next one, there's something I do want to ask you, and I recently sure. just found this out, and I don't know how I missed it. Because you mentioned the Remonstrance Five Points. Yeah. And now this came up, um, or I, well, it's actually stated in the confession. Uh, confession they hold mm -hmm. to the monarchy of the Father, correct? Um, I honestly don't remember. I think it's one of the points where, uh. They, you know, they, it's basically, it sounds like the Eastern Orthodox view where Christ eternally proceeds from the Father. And so he's not autotheos. And so just mm -hmm. for the viewers, you know, you know, if you're wondering what, uh, you know, what that is, autotheos means he's not self originating. That might be an improper term. I'm going off of memory here. But uh, um, his, his di divinity, Christ, the Father is the first principle of divinity, and he communicates his divinity to the Son. So the son apparently proceeds from the father. I think I know exactly what you're referring to. Let me, um, this is a theologian of grace, Jacob Arminius by, uh, Stengel. Oh, okay. Yeah. I'm having that well, book too. Actually this, I don't know about the articles of remonstrance. I don't think so, but it is something that Arminius does bring up. Let's see if I can find it. Yeah. Cause he did not hold that the son was out of theos and some people accused him of holding to a, a divine a subordinationism. Yes. So, um, where is it? It's in here somewhere. It's the one with the it's the one random chapter with a Greek name. Um Yeah, so he held to something that would might be considered um a subordinationism. I would not say I wouldn't say not quite. Um it was a controversy amount at the time among the reformed. Um the majority did favor Calvin's view, which is against the monarchical theory. But um, there were a number of theologians at the time who did hold to it. So Gomeris is one of them, Arminius' arch rival at uh, Leiden, and then um, Ursinus, who wrote the Heidelberg Catechism, 
was also one who believed in it as well. So it was one that kind of divided as um, the Reformed, and it wasn't really settled till after the fact of what the traditional Reformed view should be on the issue. And Arminius, it, I think it was actually one of the last few things he was working on before he passed away, um, because he seems like he was trying to revise it because he wasn't happy with the theory that he had come up with. He started to think that there were problems with it. And so he was not, he was not die hard on it. He was, seemed to be kind of grasping, trying to figure out what should be the correct interpretation of it. And he didn't seem exactly pleased with his last, his last theory. So he was still kind of revising it. So I, I found, um, on line, line, uh, as Google, the, the Armenian Confession of 1621, it, it's, it's chapter three on the, of the Holy, and sacred trinity and says in paragraph two for the father alone is void of all origin or entirely unbegotten mm -hmm. and proceeding from no other but who never left who, who nevertheless has from eternity communicated his own deity whether to his own mm -hmm. i'm sorry to his only begotten son and so there was this you know just similar to the eastern orthodox view where the father communicates his deity the son the son eternally proceeds for him and they would say that the father is the principle uh, of uh, the, uh, divinity and crisis then is not auto theos. It's not now to, to, to Westerners, you know, that might sound heretical and I'm not saying Arminius was, was a heretic. I don't think he was, but I just recently found that out over the last uh, year or six months. And I, and I, I don't know how it escaped my attention, but it did. And, and, and I found that was interesting. Yeah. So it wouldn't surprise me if some of the remonstrance uh, held to that view. Arminius seems to have kind of held to it during his, uh, during the time that he was writing about during the time of the controversy, but um, during the, his last year or two of life, seems to be un not pleased with his view because criticisms had come up of the view that yeah. uh, the side that he was on, and he's like, "Yeah, this is actually kind of a problem. I should I need to revise this." Hmm. Um, but it doesn't surprise me that the Remonstrants did that. Um, it was it was a very yeah. it was kind of a divisive issue. Yeah, absolutely. Let's so. let's talk about the differences between prevenient grace, or is there a difference? <laughs> uh, okay, let me see if I can find my notes on that real quick. Maybe we'll get a provisionist tuning into this, and they'll do like a two-hour podcast. Response. Oh Lord! <laughs> <laughs> Don't say his name. Don't say, especially when we show up. <laughs> Layton Flowers, the provisionist pers perspective. <laughs> <laughs> Oh lordy, the three-headed hydra. Um, <laughs> you're going to get the algorithm out going from those. <laughs> now that you've mentioned him, he's going to make a two-hour rebuttal. Um, <laughs> okay, let's see. Sanctification. Let's see. Goodness. Uh, prevenient grace. Okay. So this is a. This was actually probably the hardest of the four to find on. It's. I'm not the first one to say this. I've he I keep hearing this among other Armenians who who love theology. Is we need more stuff on prevenient grace. Um, we only have a handful of books. Um, yeah, it's true. We have like a few chapters and books and stuff like that, but we don't have any specific like besides Brian Shelton's book on prevenient grace. We don't have a whole lot, <clears throat> so it's a little hard to uh, find the nuanced differences of it. <clears throat> so yeah, um, yeah, look, I find that too. So it seems like the difference I found between the two is that in Wesleyanism, there's this hard distinction to affirm that God is universally extending his grace to all. And he <clears throat> grounds that in the Wesley, he grounds that in the cross of Christ in John 12, 32, <clears throat> which Christ says, if I'm lifted up from the earth, I'll draw all men to myself. So God through the cross is Christological, <laughs> Christological. He's extending mm -hmm. his grace to all men where Arminians or classical Arminians, reformed Arminians would say, maybe not so. They still hold a prevenient grace, but it's not so much of this universal extension. Like, is that, is that fair? Is that accurate? So they would, they would basically, the reformed Arminian view is basically all receive a kind of this prevenient grace, but it's not always there. It's at different moments, but everyone receives it at some point, I think okay. is, would be kind of like the view that they have. So uh, someone who lives in, like, let's say, early 1800s, 
Um, missionaries are only just now starting to really get into the depths of Africa. Um, that missionary may only come there like a few times. And if you're there listening to it, the Holy Spirit is working. But it's not always there, say. So if you live like if you lived here in the United States as an atheist, you have a lot more opportunity to hear the gospel. Um, so prevenient grace is the supernatural within the natural. It works with the proclaiming of the gospel. And so I think the Reformed Armenian view would be basically everyone receives it at some time this calling to be uh, to repent and believe. Um, but it's not always there, say. And, and in fairness, too, J you know, Jacob Arminius didn't have time in his life to, to develop, further develop, the, you know, these doctrines. Mm. And yeah, so kind Wesley, of died early. Yeah. And so Wesley, he, he got to build or expand upon these things, but he was standing upon, <clears> you know, the so shoulders of people before him, and that include Jacob Arminius. So I think that, you know, Wesley, you know, my view does have a more developed version of Prevenient Grace, but that's because, again, mm. he had time to. And so what I really like, and you know, I want to hear, you know, hear your thoughts on this. So yeah. in Wesleyanism, and even a lot of Methodists, and Wesleyans don't know this, Wesleyanism teaches that God's prevenient grace removes the guilt of Adam so that all mm -hmm. men die for their own actual sins, not Adam's sin. Mm -hmm. And so like, we still affirm total depravity and original sin, but Christ the first benefit of his death on the cross remove the racial guilt of man. So we have actually a really good answer. What, how is it that babies who are born sinful die and go to heaven? Well, that's because of Christ's atonement and that mm. the cross is extended to all men. Now there's still the, day, the age of accountability when they commit that willful sin, mm. they're then responsible for that. But prior to that, they, they're, they're safe. They're covered under the atonement. And it's interesting too, is that the UMC, confession of faith and the gmc global confession a global methodist confession they state one of the reasons for baptizing babies is because they're they're covered under the atonement mm -hmm. which, which a lot of people don't you know don't know about that but we have a really good doctrine i think for that and actually if you remember i don't know if you read the four lines but he made a distinction between how christ's death covers the racial guilt of a, mm -hmm. a man and that's different from the actual guilt so racial guilt is the shared guilt from adam and the right. actual guilt is what I, like Lucas Curso, actually commit against God. So mm -hmm. Christ absolved me from the racial guilt, but the actual guilt that I do, I'm responsible for unless Christ forgives me. And how does he forgive me? Through faith and repentance in him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is. I think I'm, I think I'm familiar with that. Um, is it from the, uh, the classical Arminianism book? Yeah, he's, right yep. Yes. And, yeah. And also the, I'm looking over my shoulder, the, the quest for truth. Too. Yes. Yeah. So, so either one of those. Yes. Uh, I've come across it. I was, I'm, I'm kind of blanking on everything he said. Cause I was, I was so much focused on the other three points. And this one was kind of like, this is, seems like, like we have the least amount of differences between these ones. So I didn't as focus as much on putting my notes on this one. So, but yeah, uh, no yeah I do remember that when he talks about infants. Okay. Vaguely. <laughs> would uh, would you then um how how would you say and it it's you know it's kind of like a moot point i guess but how would you say god's grace is communicated would you say it's grounded in the cross well well i don't want to say moot point but you know <laughs> I'm not, like i'm not trying to say like you have to have an answer is what i'm trying to communicate yeah because i know the, like jacob arminius wasn't so explicit on how god's grace is communicated where wesley was mm -hmm. he grounded it in the cross but do you agree more with wesley or just kind of go with our more Arminius thought. This would be one of those areas where I'm still doing a little bit of research. To okay, no problem. Um, because Arminius seems to have a, despite the name Reformed Arminian, which tends to be a term that's almost kind of synonymous with free will Baptist. Um, um, I think they do differ with Arminius on a couple of different points. Um, original sin, total depravity, I think are some of the things where they might have some slight differences on it. Um, I'm not sure if Arminius held the same view that Four Lines held on that, but um, I know that Four Lines, like for example, holds the, the federal view um, when it comes to original sin, total depravity, and um, Arminius has a slightly different version, actually. 
of oh the really battle. okay so if i'm remembering correctly um it is that arminius views original sin as the as the punishment itself it is the lacking of original righteousness it's the mm. lacking of the indwelling of the holy spirit and it is when so we're born without, without the holy spirit because we we've that's the punishment itself um which is the swing which is actually a view i think that swingly held um and a couple of easterners and it is when someone commits the actual sins because they lack original righteousness they lack the original the indwelling of the holy spirit that they are then condemned so that's i think is arminius's way of dealing with uh the question of infants of what happens to infants okay um and i think the thing he was afraid about is those who die in infancy those who would die without being born of actual sin so you're having people punished it's a vicious circle of punishment without any actual sins being committed i think was his worry Gotcha. So Arminius believed that all infants go to heaven when they die? I think so. Um, he seems to have had a more of a federalist view in his early years and then more the view I just described in his later views, I think. So I think he was still kind of dealing with that issue. Okay. Because I do remember Ar Ar um, Arminius, and I, and I really do like his definition of original sin. He mm -hmm. was careful to distinguish that. Original sin is the penalty of Adam's sin passed on to his offspring. Mm. And so what was the penalty? God told Adam, if you eat this tree, you'll die. It was death. Romans mm. 5, right? Death sped through all men because all sinned. And so right. um, I really like that definition. And then he talks about also, you know, too, the, there's a deprivation. There's this loss of original righteousness because mm -hmm. of the fall. And so um, Jacob Arminius had a really good definitions of those because those are actually hard doctrines like we think like oh, yeah. original sin is easy to understand and then also you realize wait a minute there are all these different views of what that actually looks like and oh yeah there's theories of transmission of sin how is that communicated <laughs> like you can really do such a deep dive on just the fundamentals of the faith and then you start oh, to yeah. realize this is why people argue all the time about theology <laughs> <laughs> mccall in his in his book on uh, against god and nature uh which is entirely about original sin and total depravity um, brings that up. He says, it's the doctrine that we all affirm, but we can't all agree on the definition of. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It's so true. Like even, uh, or, you know, going back to Orton Riley, like he talked about different views and mm -hmm. like, I had to read it. And still to this day, like, like <clears throat> I, you know, I still have to go back to understand like how, what Orton uh, Wiley is arguing for and like mm -hmm. how going over the history of this doctrine and belief. And it really is it's it's not so easy as we might imagine like you go to seminary you, and you're told one view of original sin <laughs> surprise there's like 10 other ones out yeah, there. <laughs> <Crass>. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That, that's the, that's uh something i i that really shocked me when i was reading that book and also among other things because he, he breaks down all the different ones from the early church fathers the medievals the reformation and later periods and he breaks them down all these different views I was surprised to hear is like because he talks about uh, Calvin, and it's not the most popular view, if I'm remembering correctly, that Calvin actually was concerned about developing his doctrine so much and to be careful about it so it doesn't lead to the damnation of infants that are die before baptism, hmm. and that he was concerned about that, and was, uh, which was kind of surprising that I had heard because that's not the view I've heard from a number of uh, Calvinists that I've met. Interesting. I do, I do really like though, I, uh, the Wesleyan doctrine of prevenient grace because it's such a good defense and explanation for why babies go to heaven. Mm -hmm. And I feel like nobody else has this doctrine. So, one of the ways to describe this, which I got from Orton, or learned from Orton uh, Wiley again, mm -hmm. was we have the doctrine of original sin. We also have the doctrine of original righteousness, which is Christ. Mm -hmm. So Christ's death is the is the counter truth to original sin, and so the first Adam brought death, the second Adam or last Adam brought life. Yeah, and this is why babies go to heaven when they die because Christ undid Adam's sin, <clears throat> passed on to his posterity. Again, they're still born death with with this depraved nature. They're still uh, born in the state of fallenness, but the racial guilt's removed. That's why they go to heaven. And then once they reach the age of accountability, where they have the knowledge of sin, of good and evil, which God talks about in the Bible, like Deuteronomy 139, how infants don't have knowledge of good and evil, they can enter the promised land. So God even acknowledges this. 
So right. once they reach the age of accountability, then they're responsible for the sins. But prior to that, they're covered under the atonement. And so mm -hmm. it, it, it gives a really good, good defense. And I'm really, really uh, happy that Wesleyans really were keen on developing this doctrine and giving a defense for again, infant salvation. Right. And it's, uh, if I remember correctly, this ties into uh, the Wesleyan view of, I think it's a uh, voluntary sin versus involuntary. Yes. Sin yep. On regards to sanctification. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And yeah, and exactly what you said, this goes into entire sanctification. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect segue. <laughs> <Yes. laughs> you want to lead, lead the way on that? Uh, sure. So let me, I have a lot of notes for this one. <laughs> okay. Awesome. So um, entire sanctification. And let's see, I'll pull up my notes actually from a friend of mine who sent me his because he wanted to make sure I got this correct. <laughs> okay. Okay. Of what uh, entire sanctification is and what it's not. Um, let's see. So entire sanctification is not, it's not Phoebe, uh, Phoebe Palmer and it's not Charles Finney, contrary to what some Calvinists may claim. Um, so I think, let's see if I have it. I think I have actually a Let's see. So it's not the same as, so entire sanctification is not the same as glorification. So entire sanctification is the Christian being perfect in love, but not in body. So we still mm -hmm. make mistakes essentially, but we don't have, uh, but we have a new heart that loves God. Uh, the glorification is the Christian being perfect in body as well. So no disease, injuries, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Uh, this is what the Christian will experience on the day of resurrection. So, uh, so correct me if I'm wrong. It's that the, um, the, the heart can be so devoted to God in its intent and its love towards God that it is not willfully sinning, voluntarily sinning, volitionally yes. sinning. You, yeah, because uh, people who critique <clears throat> this think of it as sinless perfection. Yes. And what's key to understanding this is, as you said, th there's this distinction in Wesleyanism between uh, voluntary sin and involuntary sin. And, mm -hmm. and we experience this in life. Like when somebody mm -hmm. intentionally harms us, hurts us, offends us, we hold them more accountable. When they do it by mistake, we're more gracious to forgive them. Yeah. So uh, entire sanctification is when a believer, which is by faith, so it's not by work, so it's by faith. Even sanctification in Wesleyanism is by faith. Uh, they can be filled with holy love for God. And holy love means that it's a supernatural outpouring of the Holy Spirit in your heart, shedding abroad in our hearts the love of God, to use Romans 5 language. So it's holy, it's supernatural, it comes from God, it's the love of God and for God. Our hearts are filled with that, so we're in this state of total love for God and neighbor, where we're not going to willfully transgress his commandments. And so this comes by, by faith, by God's grace through faith in Jesus Christ. Mm. And then... Um, would you, would you agree with that or disagree with that? <laughs> so to give the kind of like reformed Arminian view, uh, which is, I guess there is the reformed Arminians who hold the traditional like view that you find among say Lutherans and Calvinists. And then Arminius kind of throws a wrench into it about how to interpret him on this. Cause he's um, like four lines would not agree with uh, Arminius on say Romans seven, for example. On sanctification, they seem to be slightly different. Um, Arminius, because I know this is a debate among some scholars of whether Arminius and uh, wh whether it's the Wesleyans or the Reformed Arminians who have a better like view that's in line with Arminius. So I hold more to the Reformed Arminian view of. So I don't believe in entire sanctification, though I, I'm sympathetic to the view. I mean, like. I mean, how can you not like listen to it? It's like when you hear someone, it's like, yeah, you can conquer sin, you can beat it, you, like, get your punch. you're like, yeah, I want to punch something. Um, <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> person, but you know. Um, so it's, uh, yeah. So to kind of like uh, get Arminius' view on it, he's um, so to get Arminius, and then I'll get the traditional the what we people who claim the term Reformed Arminian, who I kind of. I kind of agree with both, um, which is Arminius believes that it's hypothetically possible for perfection or uh, entire sanctification, um, not perfection. We'll just go with the Wesleyan view yeah. on this, uh, that entire sanctification is theoretically possible only with grace. So he cites uh, Augustine in his writings against Pelagius um, 
Augustine's, he says his beef with Pelagius is like, if you said, you know, people can uh, achieve, you know, entire sanctification, um, but it's in entirely and only because of the grace of God, then we wouldn't have beef here. Um, but you say that man is born without sin and he can see, receive this without supernatural grace. And therefore, I got beef with you. Um, but Augustine kind of leaves it up to question um, of whether it's it's possible or not. He says it's theoretically possible, but only within the bounds of supernatural grace of God. And he says this is a question among that can be held among legitimate Orthodox Christians. This is not an issue of orthodoxy. As long as we posit that it's within grace, then it's possible. Arminius kind of um, leans on the side of he kind of like he he agrees with Augustine. It's theoretically possible. So, but because he the way he says it, it's basically <laughs> theoretically possible, but it's not the normative. So mm. it wouldn't be the Wesleyan view that uh, this is more of a, a normative of the Christian experience. So he wouldn't entirely agree with that, but he says it's um it's theoretically possible. I mean, yeah, um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, because, you know, even the Calvinist point of view, too, like, you know, they could affirm this, too. Like, yeah. you know, you know, like there's no reason, like you said, like, it's theoretically possible. Like, like there's no reason to to deny this. Like, I don't know why anybody would deny it. I mean, unless, mm -hmm. I don't know. I mean, you know, I could think of reasons why people would deny it. Um, mm -hmm. But and, you know, at the end of the day, it's if you understand the distinction between willful or voluntary and involuntary sin, by God's mm -hmm. grace doing this, it's through faith. You know, I think it's possible to be filled with love of God. Like John talks about the holy love or perfect in love for God's mm -hmm. neighbor. So, yeah. So, uh, it's um, so the Reformed Arminian view, and this might be different among some different ones, um, but kind of channeling the inner inner Lutheran. Um, this <laughs> is uh, probably one of the the ones against it would be the issue of concupiscence. Um, the issue of evil desire. So they try, they tend to hold more with Calvinists and Lutherans that concupiscence is a sin in and of itself. Um, if that's the case, then they would say that it kind of might be a problem because uh, it's all sin that would condemn. Now, they would say that scripture posits that, you know, the Bible's clear that it's, there's a difference between um, committing a sin willfully and you know, doing that, which is evil and doing it by um, the fact of ignorance. So like Acts, uh, not Acts, Numbers 15 and Leviticus 5, uh, they would point to is, um, is ideas where innocence is still need of atonement, but they do it. And there is, there's need of an atonement, but it's still, it's not as bad as doing it willfully, they would say. Um, so they would point to the, um, I think it's yeah Matthew five, the one who lusts um, in his own in his heart is committed adultery. The one who is angry with his brother, murder, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and so the reformed Armenian view that I found among others would be uh, the issue of concupiscence would be a potential problem when it comes to um, this whole thing of voluntary versus involuntary, because uh, they would say that uh, involuntary sins are still sins. Like manslaughter, um, you don't intentionally kill somebody, but you do have to flee to another city. Otherwise, you know, um, the the Avenger is going to kill you. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that's that's the way they would kind of posit it. Interesting, interesting. Just because we're over an hour here, um, I want to hear your thoughts on middle knowledge because you're a Molinist. Yes. Okay. So maybe people don't know this, but Arminius was beginning to. Or he did use some middle knowledge, but he didn't get it mm. further developed again because his life was cut short. When did he? Uh, when did he die? Like at forty nine or something like that? It was. Uh, he died at about. Yeah, I think it was forty. I think at the age of forty nine. So he, he passed away in um, sixteen oh nine. He was born around fifteen sixty. Okay. Yeah. So so he so he died fairly young, <laughs> or didn't have enough time yeah. to develop some of his doctrine. But it sounded like no, no, he wasn't a Molinist, but he was incorporating it. But but you are a Molinist though, and so <laughs> yeah. Did that lead, did like Jacob Arminius lead to you becoming a Molinist? Kind of, yeah. So, yeah. um, my first real like in depth dive into Arminianism was actually from uh, Steve uh, Keith Stanglin and um, Thomas McCall's book, okay. uh, Jacob Arminius, Theologian of Christ, um, which he's probably one of the foremost scholars on Arminius now. I think he's I think he surpassed Richard Muller 
uh, who he studied under. And he wrote an entire treatise that I would say is advanced level, if you want to get into Arminius' view. Um, I'm going to do a video eventually on it of the arguments between the different scholars on both sides. So Reformed Armenians, those who typically take the name, uh, which means they usually Baptist, <laughs> but typically free will Baptist. Um, if you find, if you read in um, classical Arminianism or Four Lines Commentary on uh, Romans or Piccarelli's book on free will or Pinson's book of 40 questions uh, about Arminianism, you'll find that they have arguments against Molinism and critiquing that. Um, but I think they are the minority opinion among scholars. So I have a list of a bunch of scholars. So I'm going to be putting together a video on the arguments, but it's Calvinist, it's Arminians. It's like almost everybody else is like, yeah, Arminius did use male knowledge. So one of the arguments they'll use is McGregor, Kurt McGregor, who has a book on Luis, uh, Luis de Molina. And he'll argue Arminius is not Molinist. Now, I have a problem with him because he wrote his book and it was, came out like several, a couple years after this book came out, which posited Arminius believed in middle knowledge and he mm. does not use it. Uh, he doesn't cite it, doesn't deal with the um, arguments in it, which I think counter McGregor. But McGregor will say he's not Molinist in the sense that he had the exact same view as Molina, which is true. Um, I think Arminius' view is actually superior. Um, <laughs> um, Molina is a Calvin, uh, Catholic, so he takes into work stuff like that. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, but I think the overall, the the, large, the majority of the consensus is um, that if you're defining as mere Molinism, God has counterfactual knowledge of what you could and would uh, could have done, what you would have done, and potential possible worlds. However, you want to phrase it, um, that Arminius does actually use this, and he uses this even in his Declaration of Sentiments. It seems so. Um, so. Stephen Gunter and uh, has his notes on this that it's like, yeah, yeah it's kind of evident. So I'd say the quote unquote reformed Arminians uh, self-proclaimed are actually not close are not with Arminius on this particular interpretation. I, uh, I interviewed Dr. Keith Stanglin, by the way, a little, Oh yeah, I saw that one. Yeah. Four, yeah. Four months back. But, but even, you know, talking about Molinism, like I, like, like, you know, even me. Yeah. Like I think God has middle knowledge. Now the difference mm -hmm. is like I'm not a Molinist because I guess I don't use that as like a a primary motif mm -hmm. in, in in forming that, but like I do think that God can know what Lucas would do in this situation or that situation. Mm -hmm. Does he incorporate that into his knowledge I, I'm, or his plan? I mean, I don't know how that works out in the mind of God. Yeah, but I do believe he has has those knowledge. Now, being that you hold to this, do you? What's your view on conditional security? Are you a reformed Arminian, or are you in in that sense? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so Reformed Arminians, uh, those who are basically free will Baptists, um, believe that essentially the only way to apostatize, uh, the only way to forfeit salvation is to formally apostatize, uh, become a heretic, become another, join a different religion, become atheist. Um, Arminius tends to actually have a view similar to the Wesleyans um, about certain sins. Um, I think he posits that had Peter or David died, um, had David died uh, after the whole thing with Bathsheba, that uh, he would have been punished for that. Mm. Um, or Peter, after denying, I think is the ones he uses, um, which is, if I want to correct me if I'm wrong, I think is the is the Wesleyan view, is the mortal is certain like mortal sins. Well, so Wesley, so Wesley taught though, everything is by faith. Like if you look, uh, look at his notes on mm. Hebrews three, he says, unbelief is a parent of all evil. So right. it was not be, so when somebody departs or apostatizes, like think of Hebrews ten twenty six, if we sin willfully, but no longer remains a sacrifice for our sins. That that willful sin is the fruit of your unbelief. Mm -hmm. So again, going back to his notes on Hebrews three twelve, unbelief is a parent of all evil. Think of Eve in the garden. Saint said, "Did God really say mm -hmm. she no longer believed God? What happened? What was the result of that? She disobeyed him." And so in Wesleyanism, even it's not that you're saved by faith, kept by works. Everything is from faith to faith. Again, even sanctification. Mm -hmm. And so, th yeah. so there are fruits of faith and fruits of unbelief. And so sin would be, the apostasy would be the fruit of unbelief. Like there's a re mm -hmm. rejection. Right. First Timothy 1 9 language or, or 1 19 1, and verse 20. Yeah. There's a shipwrecking of your faith. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Arminius puts it this way. He says there, he makes a similar distinction when it comes to sins. He says there's sins of weakness. And there's the sin of malice. Hmm. You uh, you do that you you to give um, 
you, you gave in to a certain sin because you couldn't fight it. You try to fight. Now, he actually incorporates this a huge part of something called the lukta, um, the fight, as, pro as proof of assurance. It's not you are assured because you overcame sin, you're progressing in your sanctification. It says even when you lose, it says because the flesh is against the spirit and the spirit is against flesh, Romans 8. Um, when you feel that internal struggle, it says that is proof that the spirit is there as a form of assurance. Um, so he posits the lukta. Uh, so sins of weakness, when you kind of fight the temptations, um, but ultimately end up giving in, it says that's that's still that the Holy Spirit dwells in you. But it says there's sins of malice when you you know what's wrong, but you don't care. Your, your understanding is, I don't care. Mm. Um, when you're ang like, like angry and murder, and you're like, someone talks to you, you're like, you know, you know, this is wrong. You, you, that's sin. That's wicked. It's evil. You can't remember. It's like, I don't care. And it's like, God says, and it's like, I don't care what God says. That's a sin of malice. Um, that's when you're in dangerous waters, he would say. Um, so he would say, that's kind of uh, the way he puts it, because what he wants to do with assurance, Keith Sangham has this book that's really expensive called A Mini Sun Assurance, but it's great. Um, if you can find it, if you're in a university, you can get a PDF version. It's great. Anyways, mm -hmm. um, his, his, uh, it's very pastoral. His focus is to give grace, find, give away, give grace to the people who really beat themselves up because they're weak in this, they're weak in the flesh, but they're genuinely Christian and want to give them assurance while be scaring the bejeebers out of the guy who, um, that, that James talks about, even the devil, even the demons know, and they and they quake. And he said, that's not enough to save you. Just mere mental ascent's not enough to save you. And so he wants to put the fear of God in that guy. Um, so he talks about the sin of malice. One that is done like, I don't give a damn what, you know, what, uh, sorry. Yeah. Didn't answer that. Okay. <laughs> uh, that was involuntary. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're not entirely sanctified. It's okay. We get it. <laughs> I don't give a darn what uh, what you know God says about that. It's a sin malice, and so then you're dealing with problems. Um, it was Arminius's view. If that's the like the distinctions we're making, I would kind of agree with Arminius's view that 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 is. If that's in agreement with the Wesleyan view, that I would then I would agree with that. So, uh, so you do hold to to, to uh, conditional security. Yes. Okay. Gotcha. Good. Yeah, I'm happy to hear that because uh, <laughs> I know one Arminian. Lately, won't say his name, but he doesn't hold to it, and I'm like, ah, come on, man. <laughs> <laughs> I think I know who you're talking about too. Um, <laughs> Great guy. Is that the guy we were talking about earlier? What? I can't say it. I can't. Because <laughs> <laughs> I think I've heard him say it online. Um, yeah, anyways. I'm like, come on, man. Like, <laughs> like, there's no exactly. need for that. Like, let's, you know, the the majority of you know, people don't realize this. If you're in the evangelical non-denominational world, you think. Things like this are just like the norm of Christianity. Mm -hmm. Surprise! The, the, the super majority <laughs> position holds to conditional security. Oh yeah, like it's not I, even I, like a, like it's like you're actually on you're in the mi minority camp if you hold to once saved always saved or perseverance oh, yeah. of the saints. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's something I, I remember being surprised about when I was in college and I was first starting to come across Arminianism because. All my friends were starting the stage cage. I'm like, what the heck is going on? <laughs> um, I started coming across Armenians, uh, mainly Jerry Walls and his numerous videos on this. Um, and I'd grown up in the traditional view um, where, yeah, I was like, I was surprised. I was like, oh, wait, other people think you can actually forfeit salvation via apostasy and all those other things. I'm like, oh, well, yeah, I started using Arminius's arguments against Calvinism. Then I found out he did this. I'm like, oh, how did you? How you betrayed me, Arminius. Oh yeah, um, <laughs> Jerry Walls and all the others, and then eventually I became an Arminian. So, um. <laughs> well, I I grew up in a Reformed church, like a real Reformed church. Yeah. And then when I became a Christian, I was in my 18s. I was surrounded more by Reformed people, and so I, you know I didn't know that there. Like I I was under that that bubble or in that bubble under the assumption where the majority of Christians were Calvinists, and I was on the out, and I was mm -hmm. on the outlier. And then as I grew my knowledge of Christianity and history, I started to realize, wait a minute, they're in the minority over here. <laughs> and you know, yeah. you know, they like to act like that they're, they're the majority and they represent a struggle Christianity, where it's like, no, the majority of Christians, like even Martin, you know, even the Lutherans, oh, yeah. who are reformers, they, they, they hold to conditional security and they even hold to unconditional election. Yeah. It, yeah. That is, is the bane of every Lutheran. Um, that Calvinist will try to claim Luther as theirs. Um, Cause it's like, oh, his early view is like, his mature view is that one Christ died for all. 
and that you can actually apostatize and all these other things. And Lutherans get so upset. Um, I'm friends with one guy. He's, he runs a, page, a meme page called Spartan Lutheran. It's it's split between a Reformed Baptist and a Presbyterian. <laughs> That's and fun. my Lutheran friends know this, and they're like, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, like, yeah, people are like, oh, another Lutheran page. You're like, no, they're Calvinist. And like, no. I think I saw that one actually that you're talking about, and his his yeah. page is pretty funny too. <laughs> yeah. Oh, he's good. I'm uh, friends with a lot of the Calvinists in, in some of the Lutheran pages. Um, yeah, that's awesome. When, yeah. When's your Romans 9 commentary? What's the ETA on that? And and, and there'll be a YouTube video, right? Yes. So okay, uh, whenever Dr. Bashiana greenlights it, probably within two to three days. Um, okay, it'll awesome. Just take me uh, recording and editing and publishing that. Uh, I'm I've I've been done for several weeks. I'm just waiting for his feedback. <laughs> okay. Uh, would you ever do a debate on that? Uh, the only thing is, I'm not the great at I'm not the best at thinking on my feet. Mm. Um, so I'm not the best at debates. I like doing like formal responses where I have time to break down an argument and like, okay, let's make sure I cross all my T's and dot my I's and everything like gotcha. that. So. Okay. Yeah. Well, maybe, you know, you come back on and talk about your Romans nine, cause that's a big topic that keeps people oh, yeah. in one camp or at least afraid to deal with a passage. <laughs> so, you know, love to have you on talk about and share your knowledge of this. Yeah. It's I mean, like going into this, I already, I'd already studied like the Armenian position on Roman nine. And once you start getting familiar with, Oh, like there's a non Calvinist interpretation, non traditionalist interpretation is like the, no, I mean, traditionalist, I mean like non Calvinistic Baptist. Um, you come across these other views and like, Oh, it's not as it's not as difficult as I thought it was, and then uh, going not. through Dr. Bacciano and all the other texts, and you're like, "Oh gosh, why do they cite this? Um, this is not at all in their art in their on their yeah." Side. It's it's people, like people uh, don't know what they really believe. Uh, do you do you like Leroy Fourline's view of Romans nine? Eh, no, because eh. I I see. Uh, well, see, I don't I don't um I haven't read Dr. Abashano if I'm saying his last name right. I think so. That. So, but Leroy Four Lines, in my view, like that, that is my view of Romans nine. And I think he's mm -hmm. incredible, but I'm, I'm interested, you know, maybe we could talk one of those days on your view of mm -hmm. Romans nine. Cause I, you know, I would love to hear your thoughts and just, you know, oh, yeah. iron, iron sharpens iron, right? Oh yeah, and, absolutely. Learn, yeah. Um, yeah. And Dr. Abbasiano says, uh, you know, you got, uh, you know, only a quarter, only a, like a quarter of this is Romans nine. And then you got Dr. Abbasiano here with three volumes. Um, <laughs> Yeah. It's, it's so much easier to read. Um, uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm very persuaded by Dr. Abbasiano's uh, view. So I'm try, trying to take down um, a lot of his three volumes, condense it to hopefully under an hour and put that out there. So it's more easy to, to break down and I have him reviewing it. So he's like, make sure he, I'm understanding him correctly. Good. Um, but I, I incorporate some other guys. I drop in Wesley and John Goodwin, and I think okay. I dropped in some Wesley and stuff like that. So, man, this conversation flew. We're almost at an hour and thirty minutes. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, really was great having you on here, and you're really knowledgeable, and I appreciate you. And 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 I hope that you will start to do more work too on YouTube because we talked mm -hmm. about before. You know, we need more reformed Armenians, classical Armenians, oh, yeah. Wesleyans out there podcasting. Well, I was, I was partly inspired by. Um, Oh Lord, is it as bad as it says? Uh, by some of the Calvinists in their views, like um, what's coming out of Moscow and Phoenix, and the fact that they're going beyond just soteriology into culture and politics, and you know what's it mean to be a good husband, and you know, a full formed philo uh, theology that's relevant um, is what I'm going to start incorporating into. Oh, that's world. awesome! No, seriously, because we we need that too. We can't just be like the provisionists. I I think <laughs> one of the horrible things. That's a pattern that's a fruit, man. I'm really gonna get in trouble now if they find this. <laughs> but all they do is talk about their hate for anti-Calvinism, yeah. and it's like, there is bigger issues over here. Oh yeah. Like, and even then, like, I don't want to be anti-Calvinist. I want to give a positive defense mm -hmm. teaching of the scriptures. Like, even if Calvinism didn't exist, I still want to teach the scriptures, and yeah. I want to apply it to all of life. And Wesleyans, non-Calvinists, Reformed Armenians, we need to do that, and we need to help yes. people. Who are struggling in these everyday things like Moscow Phoenix touches on things like, oh, yeah. like manhood, familyhood, how to find a wife. All these things <clears> matter. <throat> We're dealing with them, and it can't just be the Calvinists doing this. Like it has to stop. Oh yeah, yeah. It, that's that was my inspiration. Is like we're falling behind on this stuff, and it's like it's I get it. Calvinism, the Arminianism is a big important debate, and we should have those debates. But there are bigger fish to fry at the same time. We can yeah. do 
we can kind of do both, but it's like that. Uh, I don't know if you follow the SBC convention, but we had one messenger guy who was kind of like, hey, proposed in a, a movement to introduce a bill that um, a look at the influence of Calvinism in the leadership and remove them from like, oh my gosh. What I, I have Calvinists. Yeah. Like I've, I, I've Calvinist friends and actually uh, my one, I don't know if you see my spinoff series, layman's lounge. Uh huh. I don't think I've seen that one. Actually. Oh, okay. Yeah. It's on YouTube uh, on, on my channel, but Wesley Todd is, is a Calvinist. And so <laughs> you know you can get along and be, you know, have fellowship with them. I, I cringe. I hate when, when people, especially provisionists say they're, they're heretics and like not Christians. I think it's ridiculous. Pseudo history and oh yeah, exactly. I'm like, <sighs> yeah, like come on, chill, relax, <laughs> <laughs> relax, buddy. <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll I'll leave your your YouTube description in the link for okay. the viewers and as well as your, your Facebook. Um, any final words of or thoughts you want to leave us with? Uh, yeah. Um, I guess thanks for having me on. Um, pleasure for all those the uh, rest of y'all who our uh, my fellow brothers and sisters to come to Facebook, uh, follow and subscribe. And that's where you find the videos. If you're not a Christian, repent and believe the gospel. Amen. Yes. Amen. And to the viewers, if you could please like and share this video, that'd be great. Thanks for tuning in for another episode of Method Ministries. When we're signing off, take care and God bless.